Oh, hello. I am live. Um, it's my first live, so I'm gonna do for this global strike. Um, this journal. Global General Strike, we're going to be doing a teaching on Palestine with maps. Now, these are maps that the folks, um, the, the folks who are writing me in Boyle Heights at Holland Park the homeschooling crew or unschooling crew printed out for me and uh, I still have them and I think that they're really helpful for when we want to talk about Palestine but we don't have a PowerPoint or anything like that and talking about Palestine with maps I think is really effective and that's something that, I mean, that's how I um, became initially really interested in what was happening. And so we're going to start with this map. This is a map of the world according to... Europeans, Europeans in the, in the medieval era understood that the world has three continents only, Asia, Europe, and Africa. Except, like, if you, if you know your map, you know Europe is not a continent. It's Euro-Asia. It's not Europe, but Europe has created itself as, as a... I'm just going to wave to everybody. Hey, everybody, sorry, you're making pause. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> um, so, Europe created itself as a continent in um, uh, the medieval period. Um, and separated itself from Asia and Africa with Jerusalem in the middle. See how there's Jerusalem in the middle? That's Palestine. And notice this part right here. This is the, the Red Sea. They actually co colored it red. Uh, which is the, which is very biblical. So there's a, Europe is very connected, very much connected to Christianity. In particular, though, Christendom, not, not just Christianity. But Christendom, Christendom is uh, a territorial control, uh, and largely through empire. So Christianity, like all of our religions, all of our worlds, has a, a tension between um, liberation, freedom, and security, 
which can lead to a politics of fear for the security paradigm or politics of love or respect, as we say in our communities, uh, for the, the freedom paradigm as collective freedom. So Christianity was co-opted by empire under Constantine in the 300s uh, before Common Era BCE. And that co-optation of Christianity made it so that the empire got a lot of legitimacy about its existence by saying that it was the closest thing to God on earth. And so Christendom and empire particularly the Roman Empire, always understood itself as, as having a center of the world where Jerusalem is, where Palestine is. And it's a very apocalyptic, a vision as well that they've carried about how the rapture will, will take place there, which has sadly been to the detriment of the peoples living there, Palestinians, because for a lot of or fundamentalist Christians, they believe that Jews need to be in Palestine to build the third temple so that the Messiah can come back. Jesus. And so that's Christian Zionism that is very, very worth looking more into because by far Christian Zionists outnumber Jewish Zionists. And uh, it's a really uh, it's a marriage made in hell. I mean, we might call it that Christian Zionism and Jewish Zionism in that Christian Zionists want Jews to create a state in Palestine, Israel, so that they can go there, build the third temple, and then when the end of the world, when the rapture comes, everybody's going to die in a fiery hell except for the Christians, which includes the Jews. And uh, they have, you know, this vision for Palestine as God-given. I know a lot of people in my life, and maybe you know a lot of people in your life too, uh, who are maybe uh, evangelicals and call Jews the chosen people and have this prophecy that they're trying to follow, which is why they support Israel, because they want Jews to build their temple. So, 
This is really important to know about Palestine. It's very important to know about Jerusalem, how Jerusalem, for the European imagination, was the center of the world. And a lot of the time, for a lot of people, it still is. It's just that this kind of cartography doesn't really take place anymore. Um, even though it's a perfectly good map that shows the sacredness of a place, the center of the world, sacred geography, um, and we know mostly just the, the contemporary map, the grid, um, the scientific map. But this map is really helpful because we see in the European imagination, the geographical imagination, the ways that Europeans understand Palestine. And of course themselves vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world with you know, splitting away from Asia and inventing its own continent. And then of course Africa, which Europe has always uh, since its creation almost has understood itself as uh, being a negative relation to uh, Africa. This, before we turn away from this map, I just want to uh, bask in its glory too because it's very beautiful and it's one of those maps that has, you know, the, the merman and the mermaids there and also the sea creatures. And so there's a sea creature there and there's a ship. And then there's one up at the top, just a tail. And what these... What these illustrations symbolize is, um... Feelings. Uh, feelings of, of what's exotic, for example, with the merman and the mermaid over in the Indian Ocean. There was a lot of trade in the Indian Ocean, it was very active, and that was between Africa and Asia, and not so much, you know, Western Europe, which, you know, had to eventually learn to travel under Africa in order to get there. It was really uh, understanding this place to be exotic, so you see that's why you see the mermaid and, and the mermaids. And then down here there's a beast near Africa, and also near this new land that they just learned about after, you know, shortly before this map was published. This map was published in 1581. And it says America. And so, 
What's important to know too is why we also don't see maps of the world like this anymore is because there's also this other huge continent of Yayala Turtle Island called the Americas by the Europeans. And so... Maps changed after after they learned about us here. Their maps changed. The this is very medieval in its orientation, but just because maps don't look like this as much anymore doesn't mean that they. That this sentiment is is not still alive, and in fact, there is a map of this replica made out of tiles in Jerusalem that Israelis, Zionists, actually have put up. Right near the old city, and I'd walk by it all the time when I would go to my Arabic class, and I remembered it. So, this is a 1581 medieval map, now more contemporary map of Jerusalem looks like this. Now this is a state of Palestine, proposed state of Palestine, and if you look at Jerusalem, it doesn't look so sacred. There is... Uh, Jerusalem and East Jerusalem. And East Jerusalem has a font size that's slightly bigger than Jerusalem and slightly bigger than Amman, Jordan's capital, and slightly bigger than Tel Aviv. Israel's capital. East Jerusalem is actually like the real Jerusalem. It's the it's the old Jerusalem. But what happened was that the Israelis created another Jerusalem. Uh, shortly after taking the land and in their terror, genocidal terror and ethnic cleansing in 48, next to the old city of Jerusalem, which they did not take until 1967, before 1967, Israel created a expanded Jerusalem and uh, now calls it Jerusalem and the old city East Jerusalem. Well, Palestinians, when they go into the negotiations, when they have gone into the negotiations with Israelis and, and um, the United States, to create a two-state solution, which this is a proposed map, of the two-state solution with the West Bank and Gaza being the state of Palestine, which never ever happened. There is no state of Palestine. It's really important to know. This is a proposed map. Uh, 
the idea was that East Jerusalem would be the capital of Palestine, but Israel refuses, refuses to cede in, even in inch. It has occupied so much of the West Bank since taking it over in 1967. Here's the Gaza Strip, and I want to take this opportunity to point out that the people of the Gaza Strip, the Palestinians there, largely refugees, come from these areas in the white that are now the territory of the state of Israel and their walking distance, and they fled there during the war that created Israel in 1948. They fled to the Gaza district, the area, to, for safety, but have been penned in ever since because Israel will not let them go back home. And that's been for 75 years. So this is not really a map that can tell us how important Jerusalem is, like that previous map, like this one, that puts Jerusalem in the center of the world, this one it's just, it's just a place just like any other place, or maybe a little bit more important because it's the capital, but just like any other capital. And so what these maps do, because they're so hegemonic, not in an in an in and of themselves because they're the only dominant map that people use, that, that we're forced to use now, it makes it seem as if Palestinians can just get whatever land traded for Jerusalem, as if this territory is equal in to this territory doesn't make any sense. So that's why it's important for us to not get our information just from one source because if you were to get it from just a map like this, without knowing anything about Jerusalem, uh, without having heard anything about it, or knowing anyone and how they talk about Jerusalem, any Muslim, Christian, or Jew, because Jerusalem is important to all three Abrahamic faiths. If you didn't know about that history, you would think that the Palestinians were just being unreasonable by not accepting a state without Jerusalem as your capital. But the more you learn, the more you realize that it's actually not this simple then you learn a lot more, and then you realize actually it is that simple. <laughs> it's, it's not this simple, but it's as simple as people just taking over your land and wanting you dead. So that's what's happening in Israel, Palestine, sadly, is that the state of Israel 
was created from the very, very beginning with the idea of depopulating, exterminating, moving, however they want to call it, just disappearing, even unaliving if necessary, and it has been necessary. All of the people who live in this land, in these borders, cut in 1923 by the British and the French and the other European powers. The state of Israel from the very beginning has needed to exterminate Palestinian. That's, been, that's why we say this has been going on. That's why Palestinians have been telling us this has been going on not just since October 7th. So for, for at least 75 years, 100 if we're talking about these borders, and a little bit longer than that if we're talking about other colonial schemes like the Balfour Declaration that promised this land to the Zionist movement that the British imperial powers who had colonized Palestine promised the Zionist movement in Europe for, that they would have. Next map. So, when I talk about Palestine, the history of Palestine, most of the time the story begins in the 19th century. Either from when the moment that the Zionist movement began in the late 1800s, late 19th century or in the early 19th century where when Napoleon came to Palestine and Egypt and tried to conquer that you know, those territories mostly to cut the canal with the Suez Canal which was not there, but it, uh, the idea was to cut the canal so that he could take India, have a short trip to India, and take that away from, take that colony away from the British. So either way, the historiography, how, how, how history is written about Palestine, usually begins in the 19th century, whether it's the earlier part of the 19th century with Napoleon and his canal scheme, which by the way, he was a Zionist too, and he had the idea of bringing European Jews to the land to allow Europeans to have control of the land. But I start a lot earlier, and the reason why I start a lot earlier than that, and I don't want to do it because, um, you know, to say, oh, this has been going on for thousands of years, there's no solution, which is not true. Um, 
I mean, humanity's beefs have been going on for a lot since ever, ever since we've been around. But Palestine has been colonized only very recently in the history of colonialism. And it is because it is a colonial project that they're fighting, we need to understand what that project is before it even comes to us. And it came to us in 1521 and to the Taino people in 1492, but it had come previously to other people living in Europe, in Europe before it came to us. This, this colonial project, this project to impose one way on everybody, uh, one faith, one religion, one language, one way of being, mostly, is what it is. And not respect other worlds. That was happening internally to Europe before it happened to the rest of us. So, I started in 1492. And I don't start in October 12th. On October 12th, 1492, I start on January 2nd, 1492. And that is the day that the final ethnic cleansing of the Iberian Peninsula uh, uh, that the, of the Muslims happened. January 2nd, 1492 was when Granada surrendered to the Catholic monarchs. Granada was Muslim. It was part of what folks call the Moors rule in the Iberian Peninsula for centuries, since the 8th century. And this, this, the Catholic monarchs call it a Reconquista, and what they mean by that is that they've understood that land to be, to have been there since before Islam, and so then they want to make it uh, Christian Catholic again. What happened in January 2nd, 1492, is that when the last Muslim stronghold surrender, we saw the beginning of the creation, the birth of modern Europe. And a lot of scholars talk about it like that. They either talk about 1492 as being the birth of modern Europe, or 1453, a few decades before that. What happened in 1453 was that the Roman Empire finished falling. It was done. In 1453, its last stronghold was in the east, 
in Constantinople, the city of Constantine, who co-opted Christianity. And it was taken by the Ottoman, the Ottoman Empire, a Muslim Empire. And so there was a lot of fear from Europeans that from the East, this huge wave of Islam was threatening, you know, they were, they were getting close to Venice. And over in the West, where the Iberian Peninsula is, on the western, westernmost tip of Eurasia, of Europe, quote unquote, that, you know, they were, F, they were cleansing that part of Islam. So they understood that as a huge success, January 2nd, 1492, just being done with Islam in the Iberian Peninsula. And so that was a momentous affair. Columbus was there. He was in Granada on January 2nd, 1492, waiting for Granada to fall. And the reason for that was because he was trying to get Queen Isabella, who was the one whose forces were fighting, the Muslims. It's a holy war. It is, it's not talked about like about it like that, but it's a holy war that Isabella and Ferdinand were on then and on October twelfth. Because what Columbus and Isabella discussed is let's get Jerusalem next. You could understand why they would want Jerusalem next, right? The medieval imagination, the geographic imagination of Europe puts Jerusalem at the center of the world. And in fact, there's a book called Columbus and Jerusalem. Sylvia Winter, the great writer, is someone who um, pointed me to that, not personally, but through her writing. She writes about 1492 a lot, and I'm very inspired by her work. And she points out in her writings, and that was the first time I learned that Columbus was apocalyptic. He had he was very pious like Isabella and was also in a holy war with her. And in his diaries, he put in there that the reason for his voyage west was to take Jerusalem next since they couldn't go east because it was hostile forces even though Jerusalem was east. They knew that the globe was round 
and so he wanted to go west to then connect with the other empires in the east to battle the Ottomans, or in the Mamluks actually at the time who had uh, Palestine, but to battle the Muslims. And that was his scheme, and of course he ran into us, and them running into us, and all of the death and destruction that they have wrought since then has made Europe very powerful and very rich, very strong militarily. Um, and so in 1494, actually in 1493, uh, right away, after it was, it was learned that there was these new territories, the, um, well not yet necessarily, but that there were territories over in the west, Portugal wanted it, the, the, the Catholic monarchs in, it, monarch in Portugal wanted that. And so the Portuguese and Isabella and Ferdinand start to fight, but they're all Catholic monarchs, and so the Pope steps in, doesn't want them to fight. He doesn't want them to fight. And so he says, let's Let's invade these new territories. Let's invade the world peacefully with a contract of a line, a border. And the, the Pope draws a line, this green line right here, this is the map, draws this line. There's a dotted one first, that was 1453, and then it got uh, revised to the darker green one in, in 14, I'm sorry, 1493 and 1494. And that gave permission said the Pope, for Spain to invade everything west and Portugal to invade everything east and then eventually they had to draw this other line uh, after they went around the board to see where they should stop where each one should stop, and that's the Treaty of Saragossa. This is the birth of, of global linear thinking, of borders, of world borders. The, the borders that we know of today, this is the moment of their birth. It's from October 12, 1492. So we have two major events in 1492, and one of them with the fall of Granada, it is the ethnic cleansing of the Iberian Peninsula of not only Muslims, almost right away, the Spanish monarchs, the Catholic monarchs, 
heighten their inquisition, heighten their um, persecution of Jews. They, f they tell them you have to convert. You can't be Jewish anymore. You have to convert or you have to leave. And so the ones who converted, a lot of the time, they were, people would be really suspicious about them. Uh, were they were they really faking it at home? I mean, were they faking it in public and and were still Jewish at home? And so they had an inquisition where they would torture people to confess. And I mean they had they had these torture methods that they had they had an exhibit, I don't know if they still have it but I, I was able to go to Granada in um, 2021 when the Zapatistas were traveling Europe and I followed them and I went to Granada for a week uh, because I was studying this portion of this book that I'm writing and I saw that they have, that's when I learned that Columbus was there, they have a statue of Columbus with Isabella. And, um, with both dates, January 2nd and October 12th, and across the street from the really beautiful red castle that all of the tourists go to see, the Alhambra, there's an old city, and I was in the old city, and a sandwich board sign welcomed me to visit the, um, an exhibition of the Inquisition's torture methods. And so I went and I learned that a lot of the things, a lot of the atrocities that the Europeans inflicted on us, they had inflicted on each other and still are inflicting on each other. That was, that was a lesson, a great lesson that I got from the Zapatista trip in Europe just in general that there's a Europe from above and a Europe from below. And the below has been resisting for a really long time. There's still indigenous people who understand themselves to be indigenous in Europe uh, and are trying to be different and don't want to be European, quote unquote, in that homogenous white way that understands themselves as the boss of the world, as the owner of the world. So there's a Europe from above and a Europe from below, and there's always been a Europe from above and a Europe from below. And so the burning of books
books also, they burned the Muslims' books, the Europeans, the Spanish did, and they also burned the Maya books, our books. We have only four left in existence that are known. And so, what we get with January 2nd, 1492, is an ethnic cleansing of anybody who is not the same as who the Catholic monarchs want them to be Catholic. So ethnic cleansing of Muslims, ethnic cleansing of Jews. That happens, uh, that, that's the inauguration and the possibility in, uh, January, on January 2nd, 1492, uh, be precisely because, and it could be because when the war, the Iberian Peninsula was under Muslim rule, there was convivence, convivencia, there was people who, there was coexistence. There's, you could be Muslim, you could be Christian, you could be Jewish. You didn't have to be just one way. Well, you didn't have to be just one religion. You could be one of those three. Uh, but when Isabella comes in and her forces, they, they ethnically cleanse the entire Iberian Peninsula, forcing Jews to flee, to leave, if they don't convert. And sadly, a lot of them uh, come to these lands. People who are being oppressed come to these lands and become colonizers, or colonizers here. And so we see this as a theme that happens a lot, is that there is um, a system of above and below that the oppressed, the one option that they have to survive is to either flee, and now today where do we flee to, right? That's a really important question. Marunage, that the black radical tradition teaches us a lot about. You either flee, and if you don't flee, then you need to assimilate into the above. You need to become above. And so you need to shift context somehow. Where now you're no longer below and you're above. And that's what happened with a lot of people who have been oppressed in Europe. Whether it's Jews, whether it's Muslims, whether it's peasants who were forced off of their lands as capitalism was growing and privatizing land. Land that had not been private before became privatized. And 
people who would work the land before peasants were forced to become factory workers. Were forced to become workers, wage workers, proletari- the proletariat. And so, what Europe did and has done and continues to do is export its contradictions out. It has a lot of contradictions internally, Europe does, and it likes to export them out. And one of them is violence. So, people who are resisting being dispossessed of the land? Well, why don't you go find some land in those colonies over there, right? Is what the imperial powers would tell them. Or what their own powers would tell them. And they would. And they would find their freedom by subjugating others, by stealing from others, by destroying others, by enslaving others. We get both genocide and enslavement. We get both erasure, genocide, and dehumanization, enslavement. We get that, we see that in 1492, erasure, and dehumanization of Muslims and Jews. But now we don't hardly even know this history. That there was Muslims in Spain. That there was Jews in Spain. We hardly know. In school, we hardly get taught this. And then of course the erasure and dehumanization of the native indigenous peoples on Abyayala on these lands and our African relatives who were kidnapped and forced to be enslaved. 1492 leads to this. This is a peaceful agreement between Europeans so that the Europeans do not fight. This is a border not for the people or communities on the ground. It's for those who are going to rule from above as if they're God and they can cut up the world and give it out as a piece of property, as an object. So. This is why I, I, I like to start the story of the borders of Palestine here. The borders of, of, of any geography that we live in starts here and with January 2nd, 1492. Because it's not just borders, it's borders. 
The borders exist for the above. The agreements for the above. This was an agreement for the Catholic monarchs with the Pope. For the above so that the above doesn't fight. But they build their wall. This wall of 1492, they build it off the backs of the wall. They build it by crushing the wall. The foundation is the wall. Europe, non Europe. In order for Europe to create itself, it had to, because this is it, the cosmovision that it, it follows. It had to dehumanize others. It had to understand itself as the positive to the negative of others. So everyone is negated. And so, so for example, white is made superior, black is made inferior, Europe is made superior, non-Europe inferior. So it's above and below, superior, inferior. And the above makes their lives at the expense of the below. So these borders, these borders exist for the above. International law exists for the above. It does not exist for Palestinians. It does not exist for us. It exists for agreements for the above and those who the above allows in. They are those who allow themselves in with nuclear weapons. This is why a lot of states want to have nuclear weapons so that another nuclear power doesn't attack them. It's a deterrence device. See how messed up this all is? You see what world we're living in? This is where we're at 500 years later. Immediately we start getting then the cutting off of Abiyayala into vice royalties. The vice royalty of New Spain becomes Mexico. We have the vice royalty of Peru. Notice Brazil here. Brazil speaks Portuguese because this part was to the east of the Treaty of Tordesillas line. And then the rest speaks Spanish. And then here, British. Uh, the British took it. So folks speak English. We speak English. And notice that with the ways that we speak, the languages that we have, we can tell how much has been destroyed and lost if we understand the history of these lands and how diverse the peoples here have, have been for millennia and how many different languages exist. Still exist, 
but how many have been exterminated so that so that we all speak just one language. So like, again, a logic of imposing one way on everybody, everybody having to be the same. This is what, this is the logic of empire. It's the logic and the practice is that there's an above and a below. And in order to survive, if you're in the below and being crushed, you gotta become acceptable to the above. And that's assimilation. So we start getting these, the cutting off of the vice royalties and again these are just contracts between colonizers over who's going to control what the indigenous populations indigenous communities were not consulted this is not for this is not for anyone below this is just for the above Very painfully, sadly, in the ninth, late 19th century, this happens to Africa. Now, this happens to Africa in Europe with a map of, of Africa on the wall. And the European powers in Berlin, in Germany, are trying to decide who's gonna take what. This is the 1880s. It lasts for a few decades. For a couple of decades. And you see here, it's hosted in Germany. Germany has just become a nation state. Nation states are brand new. Germany had just become a nation state in 1870, and so had Italy, that's what they call it, by unifying, which means that they had to destroy every, everyone else's languages and ways of being, and everybody had to homogenize into one. That's the nation part. The state, the state is the government, the instrument of force, the monopoly of violence, whatever, it used to be controlled by the monarchs back in the day, but ever since people started having revolutions and overthrowing the monarchs, then they became, they, they had this question that they had to confront about how do we make decisions. And so this idea of the nation, the people are going to make the decisions. Well, who are the people? Well, they should have something in common, a common history, a common language, a common something. And so then they create the nation, and that's when we get this push to assimilate everyone into this idea of what the nation is. It happens a lot in schools. Schools are a huge instrument for that. And of course also in media and other aspects of culture. 
So your uh, job after cutting uh, us up over here into these vice royalties starts to cut, eventually starts to cut itself up into nation states. Um, and Germany was a brand new one and decided it wanted to get into the game of Empire 2 along with the British and the French and everybody else was in it in Europe. And so they hosted, Germany hosted, the Berlin Conference, also called the Congo Conference, to cut up Africa. And they cut up Africa in this way, again without consulting without caring about the communities that live on the ground. This didn't happen on the ground, this happened on a wall map. And then in the middle you see the Congo. The Congo was gifted by Europeans to a single European named King Leopold II who treated the Congo as his personal rubber plantation and enslaved people there, communities there, and killed them. If they refused to work, or if they just didn't work well enough for him. And so what we see that's really the logic, that really is the logic of this, this cutting up of the world. From here, from Africa, right? We also then get it happening in the Eastern Mediterranean all the way to the Gulf. This is the territory that the Ottoman Empire held, but fell, the Ottoman Empire fell in during the First World War in the early 1900s and the Europeans were salivating over those territories for a really long time because everyone knew that Ottoman Empire was gonna fall for like over a hundred years they knew and so the Europeans were like, oh shit, what happens after the Empire, Ottoman Empire falls? Who's gonna take all those territories and this person's gonna take the Holy Land? That's Jerusalem. Remember what Palestine means? To the medieval European imagination, Jerusalem, this is a world map, Jerusalem is in the center. Okay. So the Ottoman Empire held on to Jerusalem and Palestine for a really long time, allowed Jews to be Jews allowed Christians to be Christians. It's very, uh, largely Muslim. And so they were 
there, there have been Jews living in Palestine for a long time. A lot of the Jews that got kicked out of Spain went to Palestine. And, and were living there for a really long time until then Israel was created and it really messed up a lot of things which we'll continue talking about. But see this logic of the Europeans cutting up the world that had already happened in Africa? In uh, just decades before. And that happened in the Americas a century before. And had all started by this line. The Treaty of Tordesillas that cut up the globe, the Pope cuts up the globe and tells Spain you can invade this part and Portugal you can invade that part. So, borders, right? So, we're getting now to the shape of Palestine, that iconic shape of Palestine that we know. That one was actually created by evangelicals that went to Palestine after Napoleon's trip. And there's a lot more to talk about that. Do, I can do another live if folks want. It's fascinating stuff. Um, but this was during the fall of the Ottoman Empire. The Europeans were secretly talking about how they were going to carve up the lands and these nation states that we know of today, Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, none of that existed before as nation states. Of course, there are people there since forever, just like us. But just because people don't have a nation state doesn't mean that, the, that they didn't exist before, which is sadly a line that uh, Zionists throw at the Palestinians that doesn't make any sense. But for some reason they believe it. It probably has to do with the terrible education in this country. Because it's really hard to have a real debate, a real conversation about Palestine and Zionism. So, what we see here is in 1916, the Sykes-Picot Agreement, where the British and the French are cutting up the area of the Levant to the Gulf, so the Mediterranean, Eastern Mediterranean to the Gulf. Eventually, we get the creation of Iraq and Kuwait, with Britain controlling that in the pink, and then Lebanon is created eventually in Syria with France uh, in the purple and so in Lebanon today and Syria people speak French and then Armenia for the Russians and so we also get here um a little part. In Palestine, 
How was Taiwan supposed to be just a uh, internet for international dominion under British, French, and Russian protection, quote unquote, really colonization? And I noticed that in the ports on the north of Palestine, that's Akka, the British made that British rule. And that was specifically for a pipeline to be constructed from the Persian Gulf over to the Mediterranean Sea, which hasn't happened yet, but they're still talking about. Uh, it hasn't happened because the Palestinian resistance has, has gotten in the way. Okay, so going back to the Ottoman Empire, which we're all, everyone geeks out on after you learn about Palestine long enough, and I became one of those people. The Ottoman Empire's extent, see that it didn't have any borders? This was its extent, and even that, the, the limits of the yellow and the green should be blurred, because there were borders before. There were front, the frontiers, and the frontiers of the Ottoman Empire, they merged and, and kind of overlapped with other empires. So, this was the extent, and this is what we're looking at. This is Palestine, this is the Mediterranean right here. There's the Italy boot. And then this is the um, Red Sea and the Persian Gulf. Okay, so this is Ottoman Empire circa 1800s. Notice this. This is a uh, historical accident. We know of the iconic shape of Palestine because of all the beautiful artwork that Palestinians have done with that. And Palestinians and so many who love Palestinian resistance have done with this iconic map. These borders are new. Again, they were cut by the British and the French in 1923. They're new. The people, every single person, every family, every community, who lived there, who was not Jewish, which was the majority, has been marked for extermination to create the state of Israel. And those who are talking about only Palestinians, the people, we have such long, beautiful history with this land that's been called a bunch of names for, 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 for millennia in Palestine a long time ago. These are who we're talking about. These are the people in resistance who, who 
this territory, Palestine, has been stolen. And it gets its shape earlier in the 19th century and decades before. This is a map of, see how it says Western Palestine? And see how like it's getting that iconic shape? This is what influenced the previous map here of the sykes Pico Agreement. See that? That, that? that shape of red Palestine is similar to this map of Western Palestine. This map of Western Palestine was the first map I could find uh, where Palestine gets that iconic shape in its modern borders. And it was created by evangelicals, by Christians. It was not created by Jews. It was created by Christians from Britain and the United States. Mostly from Britain. There was evangelicals from the United States and from London who really believe that Palestine is theirs, that God gave them Palestine, like how they believe with manifest destiny that God gave them all these lands. They believe that same thing. And so they're mapping Palestine as their own. They couldn't map it though. The you know scholars that know ancient Hebrew and could understand the Arabic a little. They could hear echoes in the contemporary Arabic. There were echoes of Hebrew in it, and so they would create these place names, like, you know, holy land place names. And the, the, the scholars called upon the help to map of the empire of the British cartographers, of the engineers. Because they can do it themselves. And so while the Ottoman Empire still held on to these territories, the British engineers, the military, together with the religious scholars would map Palestine. And that happened in the second half of the 19th century. So like 1860s, 70s, and 80s. By the 80s we have this. And this map has roads, it's got wells, water sources, and it, and it became a very important military map for the British when they were fighting the Ottomans a few decades later. And so, this map is called Western Palestine because for them, for Zionists, 
They understand that the Holy Land is goes far. Uh, uh, um, it goes farther out to the 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 Tigris and the Euphrates rivers in Iraq, present day Iraq. So Western Palestine, Eastern Palestine, this is the river, this is the river Jordan, and here's the sea, so from the river to the sea. Shout out to Eagle Fire. Shout out to everyone who's, who's watching. Uh, we'll record this as well and put it up on our, our whatever. <laughs> our IG. But notice that this is Western Palestine. The British did Western Palestine, and the U.S. Americans wanted to do the other part of Palestine. Um, or they wanted to also map, so, but the British were like, you know, y'all are really good map mappers. You, you can't really do that good of a job, so why don't we give you the part that's least important, and that's the eastern part, and we'll take the part that has the holy sites and everything, and that's actually what happened. The U.S. Americans messed up. They did not map the eastern part of Palestine, and because of that mess up, this is the only part of Palestine that was created when it was mapped. And a few decades later, in 1923, And so this iconic shape of Palestine is what we know now, right? And now it begins with this panel right here of the of when um of the eve of the creation of the state of Israel. There's white and there's green, and the white is Jewish settlements, and the green is Palestinian settlements. Now, those Jewish settlements, a large majority of them came from Europe. Actually, 